Hi. Uh, I hope you're having a great time doing small group uh, for week four in our sermon series on having a spiritual waff, a warrant of fitness. I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. Uh, just a great chance to kind of look at our spiritual walk and see whether there are areas um, that we can celebrate because we're doing actually quite well in or areas where we need some growth or some fine tuning or we need to change some things. Um, maybe there's some parts that we're looking at that you haven't looked at for a while or you've never experienced and maybe haven't learned about. And so we're, we're doing that in a number of different ways. Um, each week we're preaching on it, we're uh, hearing um, uh, from God's word, uh, we're discussing things, uh, we're studying, um, we're trying out exercises for this. And in these videos what we're looking at is uh, stories from the heroes of faith, people who have lived these types of things um, in an exemplary way that are testimonies for us to hear of. Um, so there are a number of people who have done evangelism, which is what we're looking at this week. Um, Moses um, speaking to Pharaoh. Um, another one that I love is the unnamed servant girl who speaks to Naaman in uh, 2 Kings 5 and uh, um, shares with him the wonder of Yahweh and it leads him to a transformative and healing moment. Um, then, of course, you've got the character of Jonah who's sent out to the Ninevites. Um, Jesus, who's the model of all of this spiritual walk for us. Um, Jesus, who... Um, is filled with the Holy Spirit at his baptism. And then he's sent by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness to be formed and to be tempted and um, to come back by the Holy Spirit. He's led to open up the scroll in the temple. And there he proclaims the word of God. There he proclaims the year of the Lord's favor so that we can live life in abundance. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes, the most significant of uh, um, transformative moments. And Peter stands up. And he proclaims the good news of Jesus. And 3,000 people are added to their number. The gospel begins to spread. The apostle Paul, he has his transformative moment on the road to Damascus. And then that leads him to sharing the good news of God right out across Europe. Over uh, the next centuries, the gospel spreads. And in North Africa, it begins to be accessible and a young man whom we know as Augustine had a transformative moment where he heard the voice of God and something changed in him and he bought up some land he set up a little monastery with a bunch of um, uh, uh, people to uh, and where he imagined he was going to spend the rest of his life in prayer and in contemplation but Augustine um, uh, had this compelling uh, thing to share about Jesus and he met up with this guy that he was invited to go and speak to on the coast uh, to speak about Jesus and he spoke with such clarity and passion and, um, and, and charisma that um, this crowd of people who'd gathered around him dragged Augustine to the local bishop and said you've got to ordain this guy anyway this guy had this guy had such a gift of teaching that they ordained him he ended up becoming a bishop and Augustine has shaped our theology uh, more than anybody else uh, since biblical times um, and uh, this was a man who was devout and spoke and shared the good news of Jesus. The person who has spread uh, um, and evangelized more than anyone else in um, the life of humankind is a man called Billy Graham, uh, who many of us will know. In 1918, Billy Graham had an experience where he was born from above. He was at a meeting and he heard the good news of Jesus and it overtook him. And that transformative moment um, uh, ended up bursting out of him. And he spoke um, uh, in so many occasions. In 1954 was the first of his international crusades. He'd already done some, and most uh, um, particularly one in California. But in 54, he was launched onto the world stage uh, speaking in London. In 1957, he spoke for 16 straight weeks every night in Madison Square Gardens in New York. People flocked to hear him and they flooded down to give their lives to Jesus. Millions of people heard about Jesus from Billy Graham. In 1973, he spoke literally to a million people who were gathered, who stood and sat in almost sort of silence as his um, uh, sermon was then translated into Korean. Um, in 1995, um, the single biggest evangelistic event of all time um, took place as he spoke in Puerto Rico. Um, but it wasn't just the amount of people who were in Puerto Rico. Um, but by satellite television, um, his sermon was streamed live to 185 countries. It was translated instantly into 48 different languages as people gathered in sports stadiums and in refugee camps and churches in 
theatres to hear this man, Billy Graham, speak about the goodness of God and the love of Jesus. One more person I want to speak about before I uh, head back into the 18th century is Nicky Gumbel. Nicky Gumbel, uh, who is um, a the vicar of Holy Trinity Brompton in London, um, had a transformative moment where he became a Christian um, in the early 80s um, when he was at university. But then he was at a meeting with a guy called John Wimber, who has uh, got an incredible um, charismatic evangelism, um, uh, had a, a charismatic evangelistic power evangelism is what it was called, um, uh, uh, and as John Wimber was speaking, the Holy Spirit came and struck Nicky Gumbel. And this transformative moment shook Nicky so much that he had to be escorted out of the room. And as he was heading out of the room, John Wimber declared to the meeting that was gathered there, he said, God is giving this man right now the gift of sharing Jesus in evangelistic ways. And 20 million people have done the Alpha course that Nicky Gumbel speaks on and leads and pioneers. 20 million people and this week on tuesday you have the chance to gather in the alpha course if you've never been come along if you've got a friend who wants to know about jesus bring them it's an easy way of sharing the good news but i want to spend the rest of this video talking about a guy called count nikolaus ludwig von zinzendorf um, now you may have never heard of zinzendorf um, he was born into austrian nobility in the 18th century um, he was the godson of a Lutheran minister called P.J. Spina. And now Spina was a pastor in Frankfurt. So just stay, stay with me with these funny names. But, uh, um, uh, but Spina uh, had set up a new initiative called Collegia Pietatis. Um, and what that was was um, uh, colleges or, or schools of piety or schools of godliness. And what they were, were they were small groups where people gathered in homes, they shared vulnerably with one another, they studied the word of God and they took up exercises to apply the teaching from the sermon on Sunday into their real lives. Exactly what you're doing right now. And this was started by a guy called Spina in the 18th century. Now, his, uh, um, uh, uh, his movement that he began of these small groups actually was challenging what was taking place across Europe at the time. It was two centuries after Martin Luther had um, uh, launched the Reformational movement and the Protestants and the Catholic Church had caused carnage. The century before this, there had been so many battles. There had been a 30-year war and Europe had been ravaged. But now there was a time of peace and there were clear lines between countries that were Protestant and countries that were Catholic. And uh, Spina pursued... Um, the opposite of what was going on in these countries. In these countries, the churches were proclaiming institutionalism, Protestantism versus Catholicism, or Catholicism versus Protestantism. And there was dogma about we believe this or we believe that. And actually, Spina decided to take the focus off that and into small groups where people engaged with each other, they dug deeply into scripture, and they encountered God in prayer. And then they took up these exercises for their lives to be changed. Now, this movement of small groups um, pursuing prayer and Bible study um, actually began to spread, and it reached down to southern Europe, where, of course, there's Catholicism in droves, and uh, Bohemia and Moravia, um, uh, there were some uh, areas there where they started following this in big ways, and the Catholic Church in the pursuing years began a crackdown on this movement of small groups of people gathering, um, and this underground Protestant movement, had, basically people had to flee as refugees, Christian refugees, um, fleeing out of their Catholic countries um, into the Protestant countries. Anyway, back to Zinzendorf, okay, so he's the godson of Spina, who set up these small groups, and Zinzendorf, he'd grown up, he'd followed his father's footsteps, um, and he'd gone into government, because he was, he was a nobleman, and at the age of 21, he was the king's judicial counsellor in Dresden in Germany. And from this position, he saw this movement of Christian refugees who were desperate to find places where they were welcome and where they could pursue following Jesus in godly ways. And uh, he bought this um, land uh, and he bought a significant estate um, to provide refuge for the refugees and to create a Christian community. And a group of Moravian Christians... And were the first to seek refuge. And he gave them land and they founded this village called Hernhut, which basically means God's watch. And Zinzendorf uh, sought to set up um, 
uh, communities of study, these small groups basically, across the different churches in his estate. Um, but they reacted badly and the different divides and the Protestantism and the racial stuff all started kicking off. And he was so um, frustrated with this and in pain. And one night he prayed deeply to the Lord and he received the verse in this transformative moment of Leviticus 6, 13, which said, Fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually. It shall not go out. So when he went back and shared this verse with the Moravians, they began the world's first 24-7 prayer group. Basically, someone prayed every hour, right round the clock, every single day, every single week, for over 100 years. They prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. And as you can imagine, this stirred deeply in their hearts. They found deep connection with Jesus. And this overflowed in a number of ways. Signs and wonders and renewal of the Holy Spirit took place. A wave of repentance recurred. And it flowed into a missionary and an evangelistic movement that um, launched all sorts of things, affected so many others. William Carey, who's called the father of the modern missionary movement, once wrote, See what the Moravians have done. Cannot we follow their example? John Wesley uh, who um, was so inspired by the religion of the heart, went to Hut to learn from the Moravians and spent several months sitting and learning and seeing how they did their small groups. And what he learned, and we'll look at this when we look at the holiness movement, what he did in his small groups was inspired by their groups. Five years into their 24-7 prayer movement, Zinzendorf was in Copenhagen and he met a converted slave who begged him to send someone or some people to the Caribbean. He said that um, this converted slave said that there were so many slaves, but they didn't know about Jesus. They were hungry for God, but they didn't know about Jesus. So he returned back to the guys, this um, uh, these this little village of Hernhut, and told them about uh, the these this uh, slave plantation in the Caribbean. And these two Moravian tradesmen, a 36-year-old David Nishman and a 26-year-old Johann Leonard Dobba took up the call and they were determined to go by any means necessary even though they were told that the only way that they'd probably be able to get there is by selling themselves into slavery so anyway they got on the boat to head out to the caribbean and the story goes that as they stood on the ship departing from the wharf looking back at the faces of their family potentially for their last time the family pleading with them to stay they stood there with their fists held high and they declared that may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his suffering. So much was their zeal that over the next 20 years, this little village of 600 people sent over 70 missionaries to Greenland, Lapland, Georgia, Suriname, Africa's Guinea coast, South Africa, Amsterdam's Jewish quarter, Algeria, the native North Americans, Ceylon, Romania, and Constantinople. This little guy, Count Ludwig von Zinzendorf, was so inspired by God, dug deeply into scripture, gathered in small groups, prayed constantly, and then they shared the good news of Jesus to where there was need. And thousands became Christians. Can I pray now as uh, we are in our groups? Jesus, we thank you so much for your good news. And we thank you for the inspiration of all of these people who pursued you in their normal lives and then responded to sharing your good news. And Father, I pray your blessing upon our groups, that you would place the same fire in us, the same transformative moments in us as you did in all of those people we've heard about that you would inspire us to share about you to all those in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.